Protecting our planet and our humanity is about our actions to preserve our environment. But it's also about how we operate as a society and how we govern to ensure our actions are sustainable. Tetra Tech's commitment to sustainability began with the company's founding. And more than 50 years later, we continue to provide clients with innovative solutions to complex water and environmental challenges worldwide. Over the past decade, we have exceeded our goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from our global operations. We have demonstrated our commitment to sustainability through our support of the United Nations Global Compact, in alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and our commitment to set science-based targets that meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Our sustainability goal for the next decade is to be climate positive and carbon negative, achieving a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as measured in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent through a focus on four key metrics, habitat conservation, carbon avoidance or capture, water management, and renewable energy development. We will work to improve the lives of one billion people worldwide, recognizing that the health of our planet is the health of our people. Working with our clients, we will continue to advance the science of sustainability. We believe that global action can result in global benefit. At Tetra Tech, we are committed to supporting climate positive actions worldwide and to partnering with our clients to contribute to a better future. Learn more about Tetra Tech's commitment at tetratech.com slash sustainability. We are DT Global. We pioneer and scale community-driven, people-centric solutions for today's most pressing challenges. DT Global celebrates the Biden administration's commitment to fighting climate change. In our projects, our home offices, and our offices at home, we are implementing environmental safeguards to increase global sustainability. We provide fresh water, support local agriculture, and improve access to climate finance. We're amplifying these impacts by doing development differently. We have donated more than 30% of our profit over the past two years to our partner nonprofit, DT Institute. Together, we leverage assets and relationships to accelerate positive change with our partners around the world. We are committed to creating impact, transforming lives, and partnering for a better world. We are DT Global. Good day, my name is John Glover. I'm the co-chair of the annual conference and senior vice president with Plan International USA. I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to day two of our Sid Washington annual conference. Um, I thought yesterday I found was just a great day, exciting. I really appreciate the interaction that I saw in the chat boxes and in the, in the sessions um, covering technology, the importance of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also USAID's priorities of this new administration in the areas of addressing the COVID pandemic, um, corruption, and most importantly, climate change. Um, today, we will start our day with, a, with looking at um, the issue of climate change. I have the great pleasure of introducing my um, colleague, Mark Johnson, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Tetra Tech International and my um, colleague on the Sid Washington board who's been instrumental in pulling together this panel. And with that, Mark, I will hand over to you and we can start our day. And I look forward to an exciting day of more interesting conversations. Thank you, John. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Mark Johnson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Tetra Tech's Global Development Services Division. And I'm a really proud member of the Sid Washington Executive Board. I'm really delighted to be here with you today to kick off our session on the climate crisis. 
I think we all know in our hearts that the climate crisis needs uh, urgent action, U.S. leadership, and, and global development. And I uh, think of Al Gore's words over the decades to remind us that the climate crisis is not a new threat. And now it's the time for us to act while there's still time to turn the tide as we strive to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. The risks to humanity are growing every day, impacting the most vulnerable of us, all of us, and future generations. And I know I can say on behalf of the development community, we are energized and ready to support this time for action. Today, we have just an incredible panel, leading public servants and critical voices from four different U.S. agencies to engage us on this vital topic. I'm really pleased to introduce our moderator, Jay Knott, who is also our wonderful SID board colleague. While he's not hiking with his wife or tending to his two rescue dogs, Jay serves as the executive vice president and chief administrative officer for the Environmental Defense Fund, overseeing global operations, including research programs and advocacy to save the planet. Jay, over to you. Thank you, Mark. And we, we do have a great panel today to talk about this most important topic. The, the threat is real. We, we, we all know that. If, if action isn't taken urgently, more than 100 million people could be pushed into poverty. You could see waves of climate refugees in their own country and, and, and crossing borders in, in every region of the world. We know that the threat is real. We also realize that the opportunities are, are there for us. And certainly the Biden administration has committed to taking urgent action so that we can avoid the threats and that we can take advantage of the opportunities in terms of jobs, a cleaner climate, more opportunities uh, for prosperity and well-being uh, for peoples around the world. International development will play a large part in that, we hope. And so we have a great panel today assembled to help talk through those issues. With us, we have Jonathan Pershing, Senior Advisor to John Kerry, Special Presidential Envoy uh, on Climate at the State Department. We have Alexia Latortu, Deputy CEO at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. We have David Marchik, Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. And we have Michelle Samilas, Assistant to the Administrator for Policy Planning and Learning at USAID. Their more fulsome profiles are available in your conference materials. I won't go on to go into long bios. Uh, I'm more interested in, in what they're doing and what they're going to do. And so we're going to jump into our questions immediately. Um, with a little housekeeping, I want to invite people to sit, submit questions to through the chat function. And um, we hope to get to audience questions um, throughout this, this, this session. Uh, I'll start off with this. So the, the President Biden, amongst others, has called the urgency of that, that's needed for climate action at this point to be this, this generation's moonshot, the climate moonshot. If we think about a moonshot, there's, there, there's stages to it. There's, there's the liftoff phase where incredible force and resources need to be applied in order to achieve uh, escape from the, from the atmosphere. There's the middle part of the journey where it's important to calibrate so that you maintain momentum and achieve the proper trajectory. There's establishing orbit around the moon where you're beginning to, again to calibrate, to be more careful, to ensure that you're actually meeting all of the metrics that you thought were needed for success. Finally, there's the last mile, sticking the landing, making sure that it all comes together in terms of achieving the objectives. So the first question is, when you think about the moonshot, the climate moonshot for this generation, in what phase of the moonshot will your respective agencies play the largest roles where you will have the largest impact? Start off with you, Jonathan. So thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be part of this discussion. Uh, I, I think there's very few issues more important uh, or uh, really ones on which there are not more opportunities for us to engage. So I like the moonshot analogy. I think there's a lot in it that we can really, uh, we can tap into. Uh, the first point is that we need to do something massive, something bold, 
something really yeah. big, which historically really only comes in these generational increments. The second thing, though, is that the consequences of failure are very different than the moonshot. Not getting to the moon probably didn't have huge implications for the way civilization and society works. Failing to meet the climate objective does. At the moment, we are currently invested in a pretty aggressive global effort to really stop the problem. That's very different from a, an historic perspective on which we were trying to incrementally reduce the impacts. We'd like to see it brought to its knees. That means that the world as a whole has got to see temperature rise limited to at, we hope, only 1.5 degrees. We're currently well over one, so there's not a lot of room left for us to do that. In order to make that transition, we need to see radical and rapid reductions in the next 10 years. We have to get to zero by 2050. We think we more or less by 2030 have got to be about 50% of the way. That's a very, very substantial shift. And we've had some work over the last 30 years. We've done work on technology. We've done work on development programs. We understand better how to make the change. So we're not starting from zero. In fact, the US is the better part of 20 to 25% there en route to its 50%. So we can do this. Other countries too have made huge progress. State's role in this exercise falls into each of your buckets. In this next year, we need to get a global agreement of countries bilaterally and collectively committing to that goal of 1.5 degrees. Most recently at the G7 meeting of the environment ministers, which happened earlier in the week, last week, we ended up with that agreement among those countries. The work towards Glasgow, which will be at the end of the year, should help frame that. We're working on the middle stage. How do we calibrate? This is not a problem that will resolve itself in the next nine months as we run up to the end of the calendar year. It actually has to continue. We need buy-in at every single country. We need particularly the major economies responsible for 80% of global emissions to do so. The orbit stage, clearly that's an implementation plan that takes a much longer period of action. It's everything from implementing the programs that we've got to developing and designing new programs to looking at the innovation in both technology and policy. And the sticking the landing, if we miss these numbers, the consequences are real. We need to have a diplomatic initiative coupled with a development policy program. One last comment. At the end of the day, the issue here is gonna be financial, technical, and political. All three have to be lined up. On the financing side, President Biden made a commitment to double financing, not from the Trump administration, but from the top of the Obama administration. And within that, to triple adaptation finance. Over time, we're going to need more. On the technology side, we have a price for renewable energy that is now much, much lower in almost all countries than any fossil fuel for new development. We know how to do it, but in some cases we don't have transmission we're still not in a way that we can store power 24 seven. We're not yet in a place where we can work on industry the same way. That's a technical and innovation problem. And on the policy political side, we need people to buy in, to understand this. This is a development challenge. If we don't do it, the consequences, as you've already noted, are not just among some sub cohort, it is global. It is food supply, it is wildfires, it is drought. It's the extension of zoonotic diseases. So we have to stick that landing and move that forward. And that's a political call. If we can get our leaders to push forward around the world, we can do this. But it won't be solved narrowly just by an academic or technical fix. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Alexia, to you. Great. Thanks a lot, Jay. And I agree with Jonathan. I think we have to work at all the stages of the climate moonshot. And as we all know, climate change is the defining issue of our times. And this is not a political statement, right? It's a harsh reality and a well-documented scientific statement. Um, and the impact from climate change will be significant. It will be uneven. And indeed, the countries for the most part that least contributed to climate change are the ones the most impacted by it. And the countries whose economies, people, institutions, are, the least, are also the least able to afford its consequences and to mitigate its devastating impact. And so at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we recognize that climate change, poverty reduction, and economic growth are inextricably linked. And if we don't 
deliver urgent action, climate change will reverse the significant development gains and exacerbate poverty and inequality um, in ways that will be exponentially greater than what we have seen with COVID. And so to meet this challenge with determination and humility, MCC is raising its ambitions. We want to lift off. And so at the Climate Leader Summit, um, we committed that more than 50% of our program funds would be in climate-related investments over the next five years. Fortunately, this new commitment builds on a track record. As Jonathan said, we're not starting from zero. Indeed, MCC has been an early mover in integrating climate change considerations into our work, um, even if we didn't always speak of it as such or in these terms. So in the past five years, MCC has invested about $1.7 billion towards programs in critical sectors um, linked to adaptation, resilience, and mitigation to climate change. And I want to be clear that the $1.7 billion that I just mentioned is based on strict definitions provided in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, not loosey-goosey definitions. Now, there are numerous examples across our portfolio of this work spanning the sectors of energy, uh, transport, agriculture, water and sanitation, and natural resources management. So, for example, in our Philippines compact, we upgraded design standards for roads to boost resiliency against the increased frequency and intensity of storms. In countries like Bina, Bina, uh, Ghana and Burkina Faso, we're supporting renewable energy and energy efficiency alongside the needed policy reforms. In Niger, we're helping partners strengthen agricultural and livestock practices to increase resilience to climate shocks. And in a compact that we're just uh, finalizing the negotiations on in Tunisia, and we hope to bring it to our board next month, we're considering the implications of sea level rises for our port investments and also working to improve um, water demand management and reduce the accessibility of farmers to climate shocks. So that's what we've done. But as I said, I think we can, we must, and we will do more. We will be bold. Um, how? So let's get to the orbit stage of planning. We adopted an agency-wide climate change strategy, and we're now developing action plans, implementation plans invol involving every single department of MCC. Let me lay out the six pillars of our plan. Number one, we want to strengthen our analytical tools by better integrating climate considerations into them. In particular, our constraints to growth analysis and cost benefit models. Now these tools are fundamental because they drive everything we do, the sectors we work in and the projects we assess for investment. So it's critical that they reflect the best understanding of climate and environmental considerations today. Secondly, we want to fully integrate climate and related environmental considerations into all stages of project development, implementation, and evaluation. This is our broadest pillar, and it includes assessing options for climate resilient and sustainable infrastructure, as well as nature-based solutions. It means also prioritizing climate impacts on the poor and other marginalized and vulnerable groups that we know are at the front line of suffering the devastating impacts. Thirdly, I think it's as important, it's not just about financing. We want to support policy and institutional reform to help partners promote climate smart and low carbon development and broaden impact. This includes working very closely with partner countries to help them define, strengthen, and implement their nationally determined contributions. Fourthly, um, we want to recognize that public resources, so the resources of the ones of us on this call today, will never be enough. And that private capital is needed to address this challenge. And so at MCC, we will seek to use our grant funding to catalyze climate-friendly private investment into this space. And fifth, we are fully aware that we at MCC alone do not have the expertise um, or, or the resources you know, needed to combat climate change alone. That will take coordination, collaboration across not just the DUSG, so my sister institutions on the panel, but also other donors, multilateral development banks, philanthropic capital, private sector, civil society, so all the members of, of CID uh, listening today. And so we plan to work with partners to maximize expertise and impact. And finally, sixth, um, like other agencies, we're looking at ways to reduce our own carbon footprint because we've got to align our operations 
with our programmatic goals in other countries. By 2024, MCC expects to sign seven additional country programs and two regional programs worth about $3.5 billion. And we want to translate our strategy into practice by fully integrating climate considerations in the development of these country programs. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Alexia. David. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's it's delightful to be with you, and it's also great to be with my colleagues uh, from Secretary Kerry's office, USAID, and MCC. We work together very collaboratively and cooperatively all the time, every day, on these issues, and uh, we're all inextricably tied in terms of our mission and focus on this existential threat. So um, I think Jonathan laid out the policy uh, framework and the kind of moonshot goals of the administration. Um, let me just talk to you a little about what the DFC is doing. So for those of you who don't know, the DFC is, is America's development bank. We invest in the private sector. We partner with the private sector in developing countries all around the world with particular focus on low income and lower middle income countries. Uh, we've laid out five areas of priorities with climate change being at the top of our list, given President Biden's uh, focus on it as an existential threat. To put it in perspective in terms of change, um, we will see dramatic change in the focus of the DFC under the Biden administration. So if you look at our portfolio, our portfolio is about $31 billion, and energy is around a third of that. Within our energy investments, historically, about half have been carbon linked. So you will see a dramatic change of the configuration of our portfolio over the next number of years to focus on climate. So specifically, what we've said is that we will go, we, our entire portfolio will be net zero by 2040. That will be the earliest of any of the major DF development finance institutions in the G7 or the G20. Most have done have targeted 2050. We're accelerating that, which requires a very, very significant shift in how we invest and what we invest and the, and the structure of our uh, investments. Second is we're targeting a third of our overall portfolio to have a climate linkage. So just to put it in perspective, historically, over the last five years, we've invested about $4.2 million, billion dollars a year. Last year, it was about 4.7. This year, it'll, it'll be much more than that, uh, probably, well, the most we've ever invested. So let's assume we are at a $6 billion run rate per year at a minimum going forward. More than $2 billion a year from our investments will be targeting climate-linked investments. And there's a significant multiplier effect of that of DFC's investment catalyzing private sector investment. So our goal is not just to invest more, it's to catalyze and mobilize more to address the impact of climate change, both in terms of mitigating climate change, things like renewable solar uh, storage, but also adaptation, helping develop developing countries many of which are the ones that are the most hard hit from climate change to strengthen their resilience to the impact of the changing climate. Uh, we've also issued a call for, for uh, private equity, venture capital, and other funds that are climate linked. We want to significantly increase our funding for funds that are climate linked, and we're significantly increasing our technical assistance budget. So, and finally, we've reconfigured our staff. So we've hired our first ever chief climate officer at the DFC, and we've also hired our first ever deputy chief climate officer. And those two individuals who are exceptionally talented are driving our climate strategy within the agency and also coordinating with other agencies, including those on the phone. So you will see a dramatic sea change in our focus at the DFC to address this existential threat. And hopefully in the coming years, you'll see not only our goals, but actually success at implementing those goals as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Michelle. 
Good morning, everybody. It's always a challenge to go last um, on a list here of so much impressive work. But I want to say thank you so much for including USAID in the panel. And I, um, I said earlier that this team is really a good roadshow for what is different about what's happening in this administration. Um, you know, having served in the last administration, I would say what's really striking to me are two things. One is how much the interagency is coming together to set joint goals, joint plans, and joint implementation plans. I think we're all working together, understanding our the unique role we each play. And I want to just thank SPEC for all of their leadership and pulling all of us together for working with us um, in the NSC to pull together finance plans and implementation plans. The other thing I would say is that we're really increasing the level of ambition. I think you've heard that here on the call. Um, and it's not just about what percentage of our funds are going to be going to climate change programs, but we all have set joint goals around net zero, around leveraging private sector funds. Um, and I think we're all holding ourselves accountable to those things. We're also really looking at our internal structures. Um, so, for example, we also have set up a agency leadership council on climate change, which is now met three times um, to really start to think about across the agency, how are we integrating climate change into all of our programs? It is no longer acceptable to have standalone climate and environment programs that work alongside our infrastructure plans, our agriculture programs, our women's empowerment programs. Um, we're really thinking about how do you integrate those considerations into those programs so that all the resources are moving us towards our net zero goals and our private sector goals. And, and I would also share that we also are setting a new strategy um, for the climate change work here at USAID. And we'll be launching that, that strategy uh, process. It's already actually launched. Some of you have already been in consultations and we're actually hosting a consultation with SID members on June 15th. And so we invite all of you to come to that, to share your thoughts, how you can contribute, what you should be contributing. So I just would um, also say that we are working very closely with the State Department on the new Global Climate Ambition Initiative, which will really look at the NDC plans, which has been a bread and butter of USAID's work for a long time. And we will uniquely work with our in-country partners to set their plans, set their their programming and to really then reach our adaptation and resilience and um, mitigation goals. Uh, we really look forward to working with the DFC. As David uh, explained, we're really all thinking about how do we bring the private sector into these pro programs and how do we leverage their resources, which are being invested in countries we all work in across the world. And so we will be doing that preliminary work with um, partners to think about how we then can move into a DFC investment. And finally, we're also collaborating with our MCC partners on the ground and thinking about how their investments piggyback on our investments and how we can all work together to uh, ensure that investments um, are climate sensitive. So I'll leave it there and uh, look forward to further questions from the team. Thank you, Michelle. So it's perhaps as important as, as what we do is also what we stop doing or, or don't do in terms of taking positive action with regards to the climate. David pointed out that the DFC has goals with regards to eliminating uh, carbon-based projects from its, its project portfolio. I think you said, David, within by 2040. Um, recently, the OECD estimated that on an annual basis, more than a billion dollars in development aid goes into fossil fuel focused or fossil fuel based projects uh, around the world. And so wondering when, when we take a look at uh, the project portfolios of, of, your, of your agencies, um, are you taking action similar to the DFC? Do you have an inventory of what you have now? Um, and, and what are you gonna do about eliminating that element from your portfolio? Start with you, Alexia. Sure, thanks, thanks, Jay. So we scrubbed our portfolio very, very um, carefully, as I mentioned earlier, to figure out what we were doing um, uh, both in terms of what was actually climate related, um, but also to, to sort of see if there's anything that was harmful in, in the portfolio. So we've had a, uh, not done coal, I think the no coal um, policy is clearly um, in, in place and, and will continue. Um, Michelle talked about the intensive work that's happening in the interagency and we've had um, really great conversations around new um, energy guidance. Um, and I think we're actually coming out in a really um, good place that would have a very strong commitment towards um, uh, moving away from fossil fuels 
with very, very limited um, uh, exceptions possible, because I think the key goal is to really help tra countries transition, right, to a, to, to a, a low carbon uh, development pathway. Um, and we're pushing heavily on that, and that's where the policy work uh, comes in, in terms of really helping countries define their, cli their own climate goals um, so that we can accompany them in that regard. Um, and so there are very limited um, exceptions um, um, in very specifically defined cases um, for something like gas, um, for example. But again, working very closely with the interagencies on when that makes sense. Um, but otherwise, you know, the portfolio is, is, is very, very much a, a, a strong portfolio in terms of looking at resilience mitigation and, and adaptation. Okay. And so the MCC is going to be carbon free by when? So we have not made um, an announcement, Jay, um, but thank you for, you know, making sure I'm precise. Um, we haven't made an announcement because we need to make sure that we are not announcing, but we're landing. And we're landing transparently and rigorously. And so really understanding the consequences of that commitment is something that we're still working through um, with the teams um, across the agency. So it's an, a vision and an aspiration but we want to be able to mean it when we announce it. So we just need a bit of more time on that. We will stay tuned. Michelle. Thanks for the question. I think that is one of my favorite questions at USAID is I keep saying we, we can't just do new things all the time. We have to think about how we change what your existing programs look like. So I'll just focus on a couple sectors. The first one would be our Feed the Future initiative, which you know is one of our most important efforts around economic growth, women's empowerment, and um, working with, with communities in rural areas of the world. We are really looking at our Feed the Future initiative. We're doing a refresh of the strategy right now, and there'll be a very strong uh, climate um, sensitive um, look at that strategy. We also have brought on a new climate advisor for Feed the Future who's looking at how do we adapt our programs and how do we build in new kinds of technologies that will help um, us continue to get the yields that we need, but do it in a cleaner, safer way. We're also looking at transitioning Power Africa to low carbon pathways, um, and we are doing that through what we're calling Clean Energy Future in Southern Africa. It is a, an important initiative that will be uh, really scaling up um, clean energy, specifically solar power, and be the largest solar generation project um, in Southern Africa. We're collaborating with Botswana, Namibia, the IFC, the IDB, and others in the African Development Bank. So we're really looking at Feed the Future and trying to think differently about how we uh, support car low carbon pathways. And finally, we're also looking at Net Zero Asia, which will have seven new next generation clean energy projects. Um, those programs will be um, establishing the foundation for a net zero energy grid in Asia, working in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Mongolia, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, as well as, ha as, well as having some regional projects in South um, Asia. Um, to preempt your question, we also have not yet set our net zero, our carbon free goal for the agency, but we're in the process of working on that. Um, and we're thinking about that in terms of our programs and our projects on the ground. We're also thinking about that as uh, Alexia said at MCC, we're looking at the operations of our agency and how do we reduce our carbon footprint there, working with state on our operations um, in the field. And then we also are thinking about how we can work with all of you on reducing your carbon footprint um, and how you can do your programming differently. I know we've had conversations with different coalitions about that and encourage a dialogue with Sid um, as some of our key implementing partners on how you can be part of the solution as well. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Jonathan, do you have a quick comment on this before I move on? And I just wanted to clarify uh, what we're doing, Jay, if, if, when you have a minute. Jonathan, go ahead and I'll come back to you, David. Yeah, so thank you. So the State Department is not, uh, unlike our colleagues from uh, from the MCC or AID or DFC, isn't really in the, in the same kind of portfolio. But I do note that one of the things that we have been pressing uh, is to urge countries around the world to do these kinds of low carbon investments everywhere. Uh, we're pushing at the World Bank, we're pushing in terms of development assistance from the European Union, we're pushing in the OECD. Uh, we just had a meeting of the G7 environment ministers at which we got agreement to move towards 1.5 and to eliminate funding for these high intense fossil fuel options that are not abated. So we have a somewhat different approach to it, but we're working with our colleagues to try to support that agenda. Thanks. Thanks. David? Clarify. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, 
I just want to clarify. Um, let me just fix this. Clarify a little what we're doing. So we've we've said that we're we will have a net zero portfolio in 2040. What we've done is gone asset by asset, project by project, and established the carbon emissions from all those projects. As you know, some uh, carbon projects have long lifespans, 20, 30 years. So we've scoped out how long those projects will be in existence. And then we've also built in natural climate solutions. So we've actually invested in carbon sinks and we hope to do more. Um, these are projects which actually reduce carbon uh, by planting trees and others. We do not, uh, importantly, factor in any technological advancements in carbon capture sink into our modeling. We're hopeful that technology advances quickly and to scale, but because technology is not there today, we didn't feel like it was uh, credible to factor in kind of optimistic assumptions. We are not, uh, we have not decided not to do any carbon projects in the short term. So we have said that we will not do any carbon pro new carbon projects after 2030, and that the few projects that we do do in the interim will have to meet a very, very high threshold for developmental or strategic purposes. I'll give you an example. We are uh, in the process of, of uh, funding a project in one of the poorest countries in Africa that has uh, electricity access in the teens. And this project, which is fairly modestly sized, will actually increase electricity access by 25%. So that's the type of project where the development goals are so, so strong that we uh, basically feel like it warrants our support. Those projects will be very few um, and you know, most of our activity will be driven towards renewables and uh, storage and adaptation. So 2030 is when we'll totally phase out new carbon projects and 2040 is when our portfolio will be net zero. Okay, thanks for the clarification, David. Um, good to have that. Again, I, th I think we're all hoping that that urgency is is the name of the game, and that perhaps some of the timetables can can be moved up and improved. So I'm going to do a, a change of, of pace here and and ask for a one sentence response to this question. No semicolons allowed. So, question is: In the next six months, um, what achievement? Could you expect your agency to, to to get to that would make you the proudest, make you feel the most fulfilled about your work there? Start with you, David. Significantly expanding manufacturing of COVID vaccines to save lives. Great, thank you. Michelle. Um, I feel like I'm on a game show here. Um, work with our interagency partners to develop a plan to achieve the climate change goals laid out at the Leaders Climate Summit by President Biden. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, have a successful conclusion to the Glasgow meeting of the UN Framework Convention in which countries adopt 1.5 and begin to implement zero carbon futures. Right. Alexia? Implementing modifications to our ongoing portfolio to uplift climate while developing new portfolios that integrate climate fully. Excellent. Great. So uh, turning to an, an, another but related topic. So this week, we marked the one-year anniversary of the brutal murder of, of George Floyd, which has sparked and, and spawned a racial reckoning uh, in the United States, a focus on, on justice and accountability. And within the environmental and, and climate action community, um, focused a, a renewal on, on looking at environmental justice. In thinking about that in the international development context, um, people often talk about giving greater voice to the communities in which your agencies are working, both at the national level, but all particularly at the community level. 
Um, talk to me about your approach to environmental justice, incorporating it into your projects and what it means um, to, to, to uh, give voice um, to, to those with whom you work. Michelle, start with you. Um, thanks so much for the question. This is such an important effort and we have really taken on board President Biden's um, direction to really focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. As you know, on the very first day that Administrator Power was here, she signed our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, which we are very excited about. And we're currently in, in the process of doing an implementation plan and of trying to uh, develop strategies and work across the interagency to uh, incorporate this into our work. We're trying to think about how we show up at the table, which is really what we need to do differently. We cannot show up at the table and say, here's a fully packaged plan, sign on and do this. We need to listen to our partners at the government level, at the local level. Um, we in particular are very focused on working with women um, and indigenous populations in countries who are uh, mostly underserved and making sure that their voices can be heard at the table. So we will be um, incorporating this into our overall strategy. In addition to this, incorporating it into the climate change strategy and our climate change work, we're gonna be working on making sure those voices are lifted up and heard across our portfolio. So I, I think this is an important effort. We also are gonna be thinking about communities that have typically been um, uh, places where racial just where racial um, justice has not been part of the environmental uh, questions, places like the Amazon and other parts of um, nature, other forests that are really at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan. So thanks very much. Um, there's a, a whole host of different ways that we've been thinking about the integration of the justice and equity issues into our discussion. At the heart of it, it really is fundamental to the climate change problem itself, which doesn't in fact have an even distribution of impact. The people who will feel it the most are the most vulnerable, the poorest, um, disenfranchised communities who often have no voice at the table. And so it's at really in some fundamental way, if we can succeed in minimizing climate damages, we will at the same time inherently maximize the benefit for those same communities. That's obviously not enough, but it's a one big framing for us as we think about it. Those of us who are rich will be okay on a climate change future. Uh, the problem is for everybody else, and that is most of the world, and an awful lot of diverse communities are going to be at the brunt. A second thing which we tried to do, though, over the course of the last several months is really to do the outreach around some of the development impacts that are more specific. So while the single largest emitters are in the G20, uh, we've also been trying to reach out to those who are in a very different set of uh, different places. Uh, there's something called the Vulnerable 20 group. It is currently chaired by Bangladesh. One of the first meetings that we had was, in fact, a trip that Secretary Kerry took uh, where he went uh, first to the UAE, but then went to Bangladesh and spent time there with meeting with, uh, with government officials. But he's also in almost every single case tried to meet with civil society as part of his, uh, his discussions. That's a group that's also complemented by other groups of vulnerable players. The small island developing states, they're existentially threatened with only marginal sea level rise. We've been reaching out both in the Caribbean and the Pacific specifically to try to engage those communities. And I wanted to pick up on an example that Michelle raised with regard to the Brazilian Amazon. This is a place where deforestation has been rising, uh, not least because of some changes in regulatory structures inside the government and uh, no longer kind of paying attention from the local communities. We've done some outreach work in particular with indigenous communities and with civil society there to really try to hear their voices and elevate them into our policy conversations. We see very much that the design of a future agreement that is going to be sustainable and will be acceptable politically is going to have to have that kind of widespread uh, understanding and support from the community. That's not straightforward. It's a time intensive task. We work extensively with our embassies in countries to try to really build out our understanding here in Washington of who we should be touching and how we can be effective. We work with them to host these kinds of sessions and to have follow up after we've hosted them to make sure we're not just getting a one time snapshot, but some ongoing dialogue that can really aid us in the development of the outcome. And then finally, we're really pushing aggressively, not just on a conversation of the G20 and mitigation, but increasingly thinking about what is the adaptation portfolio? How do we think about the impacts and how we manage to ameliorate and minimize those impacts? Those will fall disproportionately on the poorest, 
on the marginal communities, which our EJ community is clearly worried and focused on as it needs to be and as it's pressing us to do. And we're trying to work on that agenda as well. Thanks. Thank you. So let's talk about collaboration. Um, in, in a quarter century of working in the government, I heard the interagency process described as a well-orchestrated, harmonious team huddle. Never. Uh, so what is it that the Biden administration is doing differently such that we might see uh, agencies collaborating in cross-sectoral programming, coordinated projects, or it, will it in fact devolve into a, a sharp elbow contest as has happened, particularly at the headquarters level in the past? Um, what's different today and, and, and how are we hoping to capitalize on it? Uh, Jonathan, start with you. So thanks very much. I, I actually think that there's a, a, a little bit of a mistake in the framing. I, I frame it differently. In my mind, you really want agencies to have strong views. They serve slightly different constituencies. They come from a different world perspective. And the best policy in my mind is hammered out where those disagreements are fully aired and we push each other and we think about how we accommodate those different views. In this particular context, we do have an overarching objective. It's articulated by the president. It was framed in the leaders summit. We're working to get to a 50% reduction in the US we're working to radically scale up our financing. We're working to get the world on track to get to a 1.5 degree goal. And we recognize the impacts of even at that level, severe and anything more than that, dire. We have a collective broad agenda. We have different ways we'll approach it. So the State Department's approach is gonna be very much a diplomatic one. We're gonna to try to push on individual countries and policies in countries. MCC and DFC will be doing investments that can support that. And they'll have a different, slightly different take depending on where they're working and how the private sector engages and what kind of cooperative ventures they can work on. But there's a collaboration between them and we need them both. The AID portfolios with the missions in countries serve both as a, a partner in understanding the country, but also a partner in directing investment. So to me, those differences are a strength, not a problem as long as this overarching goal is clear and that the White House has been explicit on and we at state are seeking to develop further. Okay, it sounds like a, a fairly uh, interagency response. Others want to comment on that? And just very quickly, I'll, I want I'll to throw in a... So Alexia first. Go ahead, quick, please, Alexia. I want to vigorously agree with Jonathan. And for me, I always look at collaboration from the partner country's perspective. They don't care if we're happy and holding hands. They care if we're delivering something better, faster for them. And so collaboration with a purpose around an aligned vision is what matters. And so, David, I know you want to come in, but I think if you look at how MCC works in our instrument grants and what DFC is trying to achieve, there's a real potential there that we're working on actively, as David knows, um, around the American Catalyst Facility for Development in terms of how we can use grant funding to spark um, some things that um, uh, DFC might not be able to do in some of the toughest and hardest uh, places to work in. Collaboration linked to your question on environmental justice very briefly, uh, Jay, really getting to local communities so that we hear and listen to their views in terms of how to design some of our work, particularly around adaptation is critical. Some of the NGOs that are part of the group listening to us have relationships that are deeper and longer than ours. And so collaborating with those NGOs to get those voices in to really understand how to design our projects is critical. Just another concrete example. Thank you, Alexia. David. So uh, it's actually a great question. Uh, and I was in the Clinton administration for seven years and four agencies and still have some bruises. For, I'm sorry, my uh, dog doesn't like interagency qu questions. Um, Still have some bruises from those uh, interagency battles. I actually, you know, I spent time working on the transition over a year and I studied the issue of transitions. And I actually think this administration is very different for the following reason. President Biden came to office with the worst set of challenges since anyone since Abraham Lincoln. He came into office with four simultaneous crises, a health crisis, an economic crisis, a social or racial justice crisis and a climate crisis. And so what I've seen is that there is just the urgency of the moment, the challenges of the transition, the urgency and scope of the work that we have to do 
changes the dynamic in the interagency process. And I've found it to be much less contentious, much more collaborative, and people are just focused on getting stuff done for the American people. So I actually think there's a different moment because of the circumstances in which the president came into office. Thank you. Anything from you on this, Michelle? No, I would just say ditto. And I, I, I would say that it was the early action by the administration and by the president with the executive orders, which very clearly laid out our more, uh, where we needed to go. And we all took that very seriously. And um, we're all here trying to make it happen. Great. So we're um, coming up uh, uh, close to time. Just wanted to see which one of you will give us the strategy papers and talking points that you're working on for the COP in Glasgow. Can we can we have that at this point? Um, I'll just yeah. say we are working on our strategy and we'll be talking to you on June 15th. So we are about transparency, collaboration, coordination, and uh, we look forward to being with you. Jonathan? And yeah, from our side, the 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 intent to we're also working on it. It's it's a process that's unfolding. There are a series of things that happened before that. Uh, the G7 comes up, the G20 comes up, the UN General Assembly comes up. Uh, so we're working on all of those, but not only happy to engage, there will be an evolving strategy that will be unfolding over the next few months and very, very happy to talk about it. We'll be doing a series of public uh, convenings to try to bring people to the table. Okay. And finally, um, want a, a sentence phrase here, not even a, a whole sentence necessarily. Um, we asked you about six months. If we look out at 12 to 18 months, what's the glimmer in your eye that you think would be a really positive thing and surprise us all uh, pleasantly if, if it actually happened um, by your agency? Start with Michelle. Um, I think a glimmer in my eye is that we are going to have new programs. We have a goal of working in over 20 countries to have new goals, to have new programs that are reaching um, that are reaching towards the goals that um, jo Jonathan has laid out in terms of 2030. So really new programs in 20 countries looking to do that and working with all of our partners here to leverage the private sector to join us. Thank you. David. So I realize this is a climate focused discussion, but I'm going to come back to health. Um, we have uh, a very, very significant manufacturing initiative to help vaccinate the developing world. Uh, if you look at Africa, less than 1% of people on the continent have been vaccinated. And so we're working on a number of things. We've already announced uh, one uh, investment in India, which will help uh, manufacture up to a billion doses a year. We're really focused on doing our part to help get 70% of the world vaccinated as quickly as possible. That's driving me every day, and that's the glimmer in my eye. Excellent. Alexia. Two glimmers. The first one is not a bolt on, but integrated. Time that is. Second glimmer is a slightly nerdy glimmer, but an important one. We need to better understand how do you factor in great uncertainty when we do some of our economic analysis? How do we uh, really calculate the benefits of work on resilience? How do we really calculate the benefits of greenhouse gas emissions reduction? If we don't get our analytical tools correct and we don't actually fundamentally understand how climate is needs to be incorporated in how we look at economic cost analysis, constraints to growth, the step change that we need will not happen. So getting that right is critical ex, ex ante. Thank you. Finally, you, Jonathan. So thanks very much. I think for me, the glimmer is that the difficult bilateral relationships with major players around the world do not stop us from moving on climate. And they could, uh, and the politics are very, very hard. But I think this issue might be big enough to overcome some of those areas of disagreement and let us work jointly to make something big happen. Thank you. So I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, wish you all well. Your, your success is our success, the, the planet's success. And wish out all of our conference participants, uh, whatever you do, try and do something to, to help save the planet as well. We all need to, to take action. And with that, um, I'll, I'll conclude the panel and turn it over to Catherine Ruffelson, who will take us to the next stage. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jay, Alexia, David, Jonathan, and Michelle. It's reassuring to hear the level of commitment by all of your agencies on this issue that is of such critical importance to every single one of us. And as Jay said, your success is all of our success and our planet's success. It's, it's so important. We had a great day yesterday. And I thought people might be tired of virtual events and that we wouldn't have as big a crowd as last year, but you all came. I think we had a thousand people over the course of the day and you engaged, you asked questions in our plenaries, panels and learning labs, you joined tables in our networking sessions and met new people. In fact, I heard that two people from Uganda discovered one another on the platform, presumably through our map, and arranged to meet for coffee at a networking table. And I, I just love that. Let's have more of that today. Uh, I was gonna mention a few highlights from yesterday's program, but I can't really pick one or two. So I'd like to ask you all to post in the chat what your favorite moments were. And if what you see makes you wish you'd attended a session you missed, most of the recordings are available now or will be soon via the agenda. Since many of you were with us yesterday and we're running a little bit late, I won't go through how our platform works again. I'll just remind you that you can find most information you need in the what to expect tab on our homepage. Do go to our discussion boards in the ideas library and join a conversation. There's one on climate change. There's one on vaccine distribution and uptake and several more and you can start your own and these can continue for weeks to come. This is a large geographically diverse group and this is a great way for you to debate with and learn from one another. Also, please check out our innovation contest finalists also in the ideas library. Cast your vote for your favorite innovation and we'll announce the winners at the end of the day. There's a lot of good stuff in that ideas library, including all of our lightning talk contest entries. So I really urge you to check it out. So we have a really, really good rest of the day in store for you. I hope you're all planning to stay. Next, we have two rounds of breakout sessions and learning labs on a variety of topics with our sponsor networking tables in between. And at that time, we'll also have 20 round table discussions where you can join a table by video focused on a topic and chime in. The breakouts are starting in a couple of minutes at 11 and the networking tables and round tables start at 12 all Eastern time. Um, by the way, yesterday we noticed a lot of people lurking in the lobby during the sponsor networking session, seemingly afraid to join a networking table. I encourage you to take that plunge. It's really fun and you can easily jump in and out. Join for one minute or 20, bounce from table to table. Please give it a try. So after our second round of breakouts this afternoon at two Eastern, we have a very rich and full closing plenary, which will include a fireside chat on the pandemic's impact with Jeremy Canandike, executive director of USAID's COVID-19 task force, and Anil Sony, CEO of the WHO Foundation. Then we're gonna hear from Paul Pullman, former Unilever CEO, current chair and founder of Imagine and 2019 recipient of Sid Washington's Award for Extraordinary Leadership and Development. And finally, we'll have closing remarks from US Congressman Joaquin Castro, who is chair of the newly formed subcommittee on international development, international organizations, and global corporate social impact. I really hope you'll stick around for this session as we tie together the conference and session themes and leave on a bit of a high note with a call to action. Don't forget, you can come back anytime over the next several weeks to see any sessions you may have missed, read any discussion threads, or view any of our lightning talk videos in the ideas library. Our platform will remain open for quite a while. So get ready to head to our breakouts, but don't leave quite yet because very quickly, we have another fantastic lightning talk to show you. Please watch Yahera Hernandez from Creative Associates on preventing migration among the rural poor in Honduras's dry corridor. Mi nombre es Yajaira Hernández, soy especialista social del proyecto ACS Prosasur. Este tiene como objetivo mejorar la seguridad alimentaria y nutricional de 12,000 familias que se encuentran en condiciones de vulnerabilidad, pobreza y extrema pobreza en 12 municipios de los departamentos de Choluteca y El Paraíso en Honduras, Centroamérica. 
El corredor seco representa una gran parte del Triángulo Norte de Centroamérica, una región que se enfrenta a muchos retos. Entre estos podemos mencionar el crimen organizado, narcotráfico, eh, violencia, violencia doméstica, una fragilidad en el sistema democrático y un estado de derecho que de por sí se encuentra un poco fallido. También se presenta una persistente dinámica de desigualdad. Esto es producto del cambio climático que ha afectado en los últimos años las plantaciones de café, maíz, plátano, hortaliza y otros cultivos que eran altamente competitivos, generando altos niveles de desempleo que también afectan la producción y la seguridad alimentaria. Tanto los departamentos del Paraíso y Choluteca pasan por una precariedad significativa. De acuerdo a un estudio realizado por Creative, más del 45% de la población vive únicamente con 200 dólares mensuales. Uno de cada tres habitantes opina que con estos 200 dólares mensuales no cumplen para suplir sus necesidades básicas en cuanto a alimentación y otras necesidades que se presentan en la familia. Lo más grave es que esta zona ha sido afectada por la pandemia y sumado a ello los recientes huracanes Eta y Iota que dejan aún más en condiciones de vulnerabilidad a la población. Es por esa razón que es importante introducir soluciones significativas que permitan a las familias mejorar su calidad de vida. Ante este panorama, nosotros que trabajamos por el desarrollo de las comunidades, luchamos día a día para que nuestras actividades vayan encaminadas en mejorar la producción, en tener acceso a financiamiento, que puedan encontrar mercados alternativos donde puedan vender a precios justos y sobre todo que se pueda garantizar la seguridad alimentaria y nutricional, especialmente de las mujeres y de los jóvenes. Específicamente, nuestro proyecto combina fondos de inversión con fondos de los beneficiarios que vayan encaminados a cinco diferentes tipos de planes. Entre esos tenemos planes de seguridad alimentaria, planes de negocio agrícola, planes de negocio no agrícola, planes de higiene del hogar y planes de nutrición comunitaria. Estas alternativas de negocio no agrícola permiten el empoderamiento económico no solo de las comunidades, sino principalmente el empoderamiento de mujeres y jóvenes, que ellos, donde ellos tienen la oportunidad de generar autoempleo y generar también empleo para otros jóvenes y mujeres de su comunidad. De esta manera podemos asegurar que mujeres y jóvenes puedan tener también acceso a financiamiento para sus planes de negocio, que puedan tener asistencia técnica oportuna y que así puedan mejorar sus condiciones comunitarias. Al ver que en nuestro país no hay empleo para nosotros, nos toca emigrar o salir de nuestro país. Me gradué en Infoc en el año 2012 y desde allí no he podido encontrar trabajo. Las empresas grandes ahora están buscando más producción, no darle oportunidad a los jóvenes. Ahora que tenemos la oportunidad de trabajar con este grupo por parte de Profesor que nos está apoyando, nos, nos abre más puertas para poder trabajar y poder mantenernos económicamente. Cabe mencionar que para las mujeres y jóvenes estas oportunidades representan una alternativa para que puedan generar empleo en sus comunidades y de esta manera no se vean forzados a emigrar del campo a la ciudad o peor aún, lo que hemos visto en los últimos años sobre la migración masiva en las caravanas que se realizan hacia Estados Unidos, provocando con esto que las personas se puedan arriesgar en un camino que muchas veces no tiene retorno. Es por esa razón que nuestras oportunidades deben estar enfocadas en buscar soluciones reales a los retos de la comunidad que permita generar alternativas inclusivas para todos los miembros de la población. Asimismo, se deben incluir en estas oportunidades a las mujeres y jóvenes para que de esta manera ellas puedan ver como una alternativa poder mejorar su calidad de vida en las propias comunidades y no verse forzados a la migración que pone en riesgo su vida y la vida de sus familias.